I'd like to stay here longer than man's allotted days And watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high I'll live with him forever in glory by and by Oh yes, I'll live in glory by and by it is good to see everyone out this morning. We thank you for coming and thank you for tuning in wherever you are. Certainly, we must always say that God is good and that he's good all the time. He has spared our lives to see this day in which we can come, assemble to worship him in spirit and in truth. So let us get our minds ready as we study God's word. Of course, we continue our discussion from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21. Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Now, in view of the fact that Christ is coming again in view of the fact that there will be many who will apostatize from the truth and preach and teach false doctrines the apostle paul told these thessalonians to prove all things hold fast to that which is good now the word prove Adoximatsete uh, means to test and to prove both the gifts and the behavior of Christians have to be tested. If a person claims to prophesy, whether proclaiming the gospel or predicting some event to strengthen Christians for some coming trial, all should be tested. We are not to blindly accept what people say, even if it is the preacher or the servant of God. Neither are we to blindly accept people themselves. Every person, what he does and what he says is to be tested and proven. But why and how? First, by measuring what he says and does by the scripture. But note, the scriptures must be studied in order to measure what people say and do. And the only way to know the truth or know truth from error is to know the scriptures. You cannot expect to refute something unless you know what the Bible says. Now, you don't have to know everything that everyone says. You just have to know what the Bible says. And then you are able to make judgments. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Again, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. And then in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. In Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 27, God says, I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people, that thou mayest know and try their way. Prove all things. Examine all things by truth. To examine all things by truth, you have to believe that truth is absolute. You have to believe in such a thing as absolute truth. And if there's absolute truth, then it has to come from somewhere, from someone who is not able to fall or to make mistakes. And that person is God. And that God has to communicate to us through one means, and that is through the scriptures. 
That's why Paul would say in 2 Timothy 3, 6 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So we suggest this morning that claims of truth need to be challenged. Now, Again, in, in our text, Paul says, prove or test all things. Now, this is not quenching the spirit or despising prophecies, but a recognition that all claims to be from God are truly, or uh, rather are true. And if they are true, then they must be obeyed. As John wrote in 1 John 4 and verse 1, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. For many false prophets have come into the world. It is not quenching the spirit to test what people claim as a revelation from God. Then there's something else we need to look at. We got to examine claims of truth. You notice everyone says, well, what I say is true, but is it? What does the Bible say? Remember the, 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 the um, Bereans in Acts chapter 17 verse 11? What about these people? Bible says they receive the word with all readiness. That is, they paid careful attention to what Paul said. They search the scriptures, how often? Daily. Why? To see if what Paul taught is true. It's true. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, around verse 6, Paul would say, Don't believe any man above that which is written. So this truth is written down. And if Paul would say, Paul, an apostle, a man given a special message from God, and he would say, don't believe any man above that which is written, then there is something written. So that we can have faith. As, uh, as we read, faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17, and hearing what? The word of God. So then they test what, they, what, what Paul was teaching for which they were commended as being fair-minded. In examining all things by truth today, we need to give people, yes, a fair hearing. Remember back in, in, in Psalms 119 and verse 160, the word is true from the beginning and every one of thy righteous judgments endure it forever. And we know this is talking first of all about the Old Testament scriptures. So search the scriptures daily looking at God's word in its entirety. Accepting that which is in harmony with the apostles teaching and rejecting that which is not. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 6, Bible says, We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Hold on just a minute. Us? This is the Apostle John, along with the others. John says, listen, if it doesn't come from us, it's not truth. But what about those words or the teachings of the church fathers? The teachings of the church fathers are not found in the Bible, the so-called church fathers. But the teachings of the apostles are found in the scriptures. So if we have the teachings of the fathers, then we don't need the teachings of the Bible. And if we have the teachings of the Bible, we don't need the teachings of the fathers. It's one or two. 
or one or the other. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, notice what Luke writes, and they continued um, steadfastly in what? The apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So what then is our duty to the truth? This does not end with simply believing the truth and rejecting that which is false. We must also hold fast to that which is good. I take this to mean, listen, that we must apply the truth in our lives. With, of course, with proper attitudes. A prayerful attitude like David, or like David possessed for that matter, in Psalms 86 verse 11, he says, Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. Now, now these are not just sentiments of David, but they should be of ours, ours too. This should be what should be in our minds. We must have this prayerful attitude. God, show me your way. But how is God going to show me? Except through my searching of the scriptures. We must have a meek spirit. That is, allowing God's word to be implanted in us. James 1:21. Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and the superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to do what? Save your souls. This we must do with right actions. Indeed, not just word, but of course in love. In 1 John 3, 18 and 19, my little children, John says, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. What's the background here, John's background? I'm talking about what's, what's involved. John is preaching at a time when Gnosticism was really in full bloom. You see, the other apostles are dead. John is the last one to be alive. And there are those who, who were long time ago before this in Colossians who were teaching that they had a special knowledge and they didn't need Jesus. So when John begins his first letter, he kind of bring these Gnostics together who were talking about their special knowledge and saying some, some, some things about Christ. And then John would say, look, you don't know what you're talking about. I know Jesus. I was there with him. I walked with him. I ate with him. I slept in the same place with him. I know this Jesus. And here you're telling me that this Jesus doesn't amount to anything or he was just a prophet or he was just a good man of God. No, he is the son of God. And when you go back to his first book, John chapter 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And this same Jesus told the Pharisees before Abraham was, I am. That he is eternal. Listen, listen, listen. So there must be the right action. We must be doers of the word and not hearers only. James 1, 22 and 23. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding the natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway he forgets what manner of man he was. 
So thereby walking in the truth. Listen what he says as James 1 and 25. But whose word looketh where? In the perfect law of liberty. What is the perfect law of liberty? It's this. This is where freedom is. This is uh, all the, 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 the road map to freedom is this book. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein. He being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Thereby walking in the truth which delights those who see you. Third John verses 3 and 4. Listen to John, he says, For I rejoice greatly. When the brethren came and testify of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth, as he writes to thee, like lady, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Listen, we need to understand truth is not in the political arena. Truth is not even in those who support the law in courtrooms. Truth is in the word of God. This is the only truth that is trustworthy. For whatever God says is truth. For he is truth. Prove all things. This is a forgotten command. Many feel insulted if you ask them to prove anything about their religion. You can't ask every preacher to prove all things. He's going to feel, feel insulted. And that's the reason why we're here. We're supposed to prove from the word of God what we preach. Listen. But listen to this. Yet I have not only the right, but the obligation to ask people questions about their religion. And they have the same right and obligation to ask me to prove mine. Can you prove yours from the word of God? I am not talking about history. I'm not talking about nothing else but from the word of God. Can you prove it from the word of God? Because when you look back into those who have started this or that, you will find out that God was not part of it. Because most of it came because someone was dissatisfied with something somewhere and decided they can do better. First Peter chapter 3 verse 15. Peter asked us something, of us something that we need to think about. Be ready. Be ready always to do what? Give an answer. If you can't give an answer, you need to go back to your Bible. This command denies an often made statement where you can prove anything by the Bible. No, my friends, this command would be foolish if you could prove anything or if you could prove anything by the Bible. Listen. If you could prove anything by the Bible, there would really be no sense in proving all things because you would need no proof. If Paul says to prove all things, then there has to be some things that cannot be proven. Why say prove all things if everything is already been proven? Some things cannot be proved by the Bible. Therefore, there are some things start that are not from the Bible. 
and man cannot find biblical proof for him. What about you? Do you believe something that you cannot prove from the word of God? Is it what grandma said or what grandpa said? Is it what tradition said? Is it what custom said? Sometimes we have to make a difference between traditions, customs, and scripture. They're not, all, they're not always the same. Why prove anything if it does not matter what a person believes? Because some folks are going to tell you, well, it really doesn't matter. We all go to heaven. Prove it. Prove it. But what is involved in proving? Because there are some wrong ways of proving. Number one, you cannot prove by assuming. We make a lot of assumptions, don't we? We have a lot of perceptions, don't we? Perceptions can be real or imagined. And sometimes you can't even tell the difference. Because the person who makes that perception may think this is real, but it cannot be proved to be real. We all have perceptions, don't we? Many assume things taken in a religion and then expect you to take their word for it. Don't you remember? Well, some of you are too young for this. When, when, when grandma was the rule and grandma comes and he says, the Bible says that every tub shall sit on its own bottom. And as a child, you believe that because grandma said but now you're older, you have searched the scriptures, you have found that is not so. It's nowhere in the Bible. There was a time we accept some things. And we didn't look for proof because we just believed in the person. And we assumed what the person said was correct. There are many claims that are based purely on assumptions. It is an assumption that because there are good people or morally good people in all churches, that all churches are good in God's sight. That's an assumption and that's where it should stay because it is not in the word of God. Because the Apostle Paul says in Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. It doesn't mean all these churches in the world are in the Bible. No, he's referring to congregations of the Lord's church in different cities. Same church, one church in different cities. That's not an assumption, that's a fact. Because the church, or the letter written to the church at Rome was meant to be read in different congregations, just like any other letter. You cannot prove by supposition. Some on Pentecost supposed that the apostles were drunk, remember, in Acts chapter 2. When the Holy Spirit came, and they began to accuse the apostles of being drunk. Peter says, hold on just a minute. It's just nine o'clock in the morning. Folks haven't had time to drink enough yet to be drunk. But he said, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Peter says, this is prophecy being fulfilled. Joel 2, 28 through 32. In verse 15, of course, in Acts 2, Peter denied that the supposition was right. Some suppose that Jesus said that John would not die. And they started telling it as if their supposition proved it. Some of them, when they saw John the Baptist, they thought this was Elijah resurrected. But that was not a fact. It was a supposition. 
But John says, yet Jesus said on, not unto him, he shall not die. But if, but if I will that the, he tarry till I come again, what is it to you? Sometimes some folks take some things under their own hands that they have no business touching. So you cannot prove by, by accusation. The Jews accused Paul of being a, 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 a pestilent fellow, a mover of sedition, a ringleader of the sect of Nazarenes. Well, that was their supposition. That was their accusation. But that wasn't true at all. He was an apostle of Christ. Listen, as we close out from those of you watching, know your Bible. We want you to know this morning that you can know the truth. Because Christ said the truth shall make you free. The truth about your salvation comes when you believe Christ and you have repented of your sins. You, you acknowledge Christ as the Son of God and you're baptized. That's the truth about your salvation because that is what is found in the book of Acts. All the conversions, everyone did the same thing. Writers, scholars, emailers will be glad to answer further questions from you. So tune in again next week, the Lord's win, as we continue this discussion. But to those of us who are here, we need to remember the charges laid against Apostle Paul could not be proven. That you cannot prove by misrepresentation. The Jews said of false witnesses. To mis misrepresent Stephen and accuse him of blaspheming God and Moses. They built up a straw man that they could not tear down. But they did not prove Stephen wrong. So when they couldn't prove him wrong, guess what they did? Stone him to death. That's a way of getting rid of the truth. But they couldn't get rid of the truth. They got rid of Stephen. But God always raised up others to preach the truth. Listen carefully. We haven't seen much yet in this country. It's coming. It's coming to us in the church. When laws are going to be made that we have to accept certain things in the church. Then we're going to have to prove what the Bible says and whether or not we believe what the Bible says to stand up for it. Even if it means our imprisonment. There are those who are still working very hard. And unfortunately, there are those in the church who may have this mindset still uh, that women can preach publicly in the presence of men and women despite what Paul says in 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Corinthians 14. And the time is coming when they are going to go to law against us for preaching the word of God. Truth, my friends, biblical truth does not change, cannot change, because God is unchangeable. For truth to change, God has to change. But God is not going to change. Listen, listen. There are right ways of proving. According to Webster, the definition is to demonstrate by reasoning or evidence cause to be accepted as genuine. To test, to prove, to examine, to try. In Luke chapter 14 verse 19, 
And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. <laughs> I pray thee. We're just looking at the word prove. We're not looking at the context here. Okay, this is an interesting one. Giving reasons why we shouldn't do what the Bible says. To examine in the King James to prove American standard. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 20. When you come together therefore in one place. This is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Uh oh. They had abused the Lord's Supper. Using it as a common meal. And Paul confronted them to try, as we read in 1 John 4 and verse 11, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try. You got it? Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2. I know, they, I know thy works and thy labor. And thy patience, how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. It is amazing today that we find so many self made titles and positions. You hear these men saying, well, I'm apostle of this and apostle. Even women say, I'm, I'm apostle of this. Ladies and gentlemen, God chose only 12. True, it's about 14 that were chosen. But of course, two of them died and came back to 12. And according to Acts chapter 1, there were certain qualifications one must have. One must have been with Jesus from his baptism until his ascension. And the apostle Paul would say, I am the least, he came in the last. And if Paul said he came in the last, then there's no more after Paul. So he was not the last one to live. John was. John lived in about 96 AD when he wrote Revelation from the Isles of Patmos. But Paul was the last of the apostles. I am less than the least of all saints. And he says, this grace was given. This opportunity to preach the word was given to him after his conversion. He saw Jesus different from the others. He saw Jesus because after his conversion, he was caught up. Where, to heaven where he saw Jesus where he received his apostleship the others saw him face to face so you see it is important to prove all things somebody comes to you and say I am Reverend Thomas Dick or the, the Reverend Dr. Dick prove what you call yourself from the Bible because the psalmist tells us, holy, speaking to God, about God, holy and reverent is thy name. Remember what we have said in the past, in order for men to carry that title, listen what ha has to happen. Number one, he has to bring God down to the level of man or lift man up to the level of God. Because God alone is reverent. If you can prove your title, don't use it. Don't use it. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. No, 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 listen. All religious people do some things that are right. Any could give proof for a part of his practice. But take a look over to Romans chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. 
For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not as the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things containing the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves. When one proves some things right, he is still short of the obligation imposed by the command. Saul could have satisfied both Samuel and God in this manner. But listen, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, God told um, Saul through Samuel, go and completely destroy the Amalekites. Saul went and he fought the Amalekites, but he brought back King Agag and the best of the spoils. Samuel asked him, have you obeyed God? Saul said, yes, I did. But at the same time he was saying he did, Samuel heard the animals and he asked the question, come on, man. Then Saul began to say, well, the people wanted a sacrifice. And listen to what Samuel says, it is better to obey than sacrifice. So Saul is like most religious people. Yes, they do some things right, but some things are missing. Listen. Apollos could prove some things. That Jesus was, was the Christ, but he could not prove his teaching and practice of John's baptism. In Acts chapter 18. You remember the story? Oh, he was a good man. Apollos was a good man. But he found out something about himself. He didn't have it all together. A good man. And this is what happens to good folks. God provides an opportunity for good, honest folks to hear the truth and obey the truth. God will not force a person to obey. It is up to him. But God provides the opportunity. The question is, do I have enough honesty to see what is being taught is the word of God or not. My honesty is at stake. Every act and every step needs proof. Hebrews 11 and verse 6 and Romans 10, 17. Number one, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Number two, one must believe. For God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. What is the source of proof? Because there's some wrong sources of, pr of proof. Number one, the wrong source of proof is feeling. Some of the folks, let me put it this way. Too many of us have more feelings in our feet than we have in our head. Feeling has never been a biblical standard of anything. Feeling is the wrong source. Proverbs 26 or 28, 26. By this standard, the publicans condemned and the Pharisees justified. The Pharisees felt that he was all right. Was his religion therefore right? 
Suppose you feel that you are saved. And I feel that you are lost. Whose feelings are you going by? Mine or yours? What about parents? Are they the standard of proof? Or the source of proof? This standard, my friends, would have proven the Jews right that stoned Stephen. For he said of them, as your father did, so do ye. If they had read more of the Old Testament scriptures, they would have known the proof. If they had known, read Isaiah chapter 53, they would have known who Christ would, would be. But rather, they relied on their fathers. Their religion was wrong. Numbers of popularity is the wrong source. <laughs> oh, don't get me started. There are some churches in this town where all the so-called pe big people in Columbus are. That's the popular church to be in. That's where the big folks in politics and, and government are in. And after church on Sunday morning, they go out and live like the devil all week long. They lie, they cheat, they fornicate, everything else. But show up on Sunday morning with the big money. As if that's going to save them. Popularity is not a proper source. Numbers do not prove a thing right. Exodus 23 and verse 2. Popularity would have, would have required God to save the world and drown Noah. Because Noah and his family, only how many? Eight souls? And the rest of the world lost? Popularity would have proven Christ wrong, for he was one of the most unpopular men that ever lived. What about conscience then? Is it the right source of proof? But the Bible says some have defiled their conscience. For um, Titus 1 and verse 15. Others have said their conscience. For Timothy 1 again. Is this kind of conscience still a guide? What about the woman who thought that her conscience tell her to throw her child into the Ganges River? Was she right? There are many people today running around with saying that conscience is the guide and most of them are in jail. Sometimes we look at other people. Some say, I will get so and so to prove it. Now this is one thing I hate sometimes about us. You got to wake me up in the night around one o'clock to ask me a question about Bible and you have your Bible in your own home. That tells me you've not been reading, you've not been studying. But you want the preacher to always have an answer for you. When you should be studying yourself. But you cannot know the Bible because we only see you once a week. Therefore, there is not sufficient knowledge in your head to answer simple questions. Even as talking to somebody about Christ, you can't do it because you don't have the knowledge. See, that's what you pay the preacher for in your head. Second Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of, of, of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves, comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. In 
finally, this morning, that's not the end of the lesson, but finally, some use the law that has been abolished. That's not the right source. We have been talking about that on Wednesday nights, don't we? You know, you know what's amazing? We go to the law against abortion. But we forget what the New Testament says, what our attitude should be. Our attitude should be to save that young lady's soul. It, and we may, when we save her soul, we end up saving two lives. You understand? How many of us would go marching down the streets against abortion, but would not take one child into our homes? Not one child, not one baby. We would not help a little child, a little baby. But we want to send the mother to hell. Now, I'm not suggesting it is right. Not, not at all. I'm talking about Jesus telling the Pharisees about the weightier matters of the law. To learn, to love, to show kindness. You know what? All of us individually ought to be supporting Agape. You know what Agape is? It's an organization within the church. Now in Atlanta and other parts of the country, what do they do there? They take in pregnant girls, find a home for them, so that the baby will be born and then that baby is put into adoption among Christian folks. What are you doing to show that love that is needed? That kindness that the law not necessarily talk about, but which Christ talks about. Sometimes we let the Pharisees say, don't do this, don't do that. But what are we doing as individuals to make a difference? In our world. That's the question. Prove. All things. Then Jesus said. In as much. As he didn't do, he didn't do it into one of these. He didn't do it unto me. That he will see at the judgment. What about the senior members of the church? What do we do for them who cannot help themselves? Do we attach ourselves to them? Who says we'll come over and cut your grass or wash your dishes or something like that? Who says that? We'll cook your meal each day. Who does that? We get so busy with ourselves, we forget others prove all things prove your faith prove your faith as people get older their friends die out and sometimes they are left alone isn't that what we should do James 1 27 Pure religion and undefiled before God is that you visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and keep yourself, I rather like to say, in an, and in the process, keep yourself unspotted. The word visit here doesn't mean to go and see, but to provide what's needed. Prove all things. And next week we'll talk about Hold fast to that which is good. Are you a Christian this morning? We never ask anyone to come join the church. You can't do it. You cannot join the church of Christ 
Acts 2 47 tells us the Lord adds to the church daily such as should be saved. Acts 2 38 Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and he shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 41, then they that gladly receive his word were baptized and the same they were added unto them were 3,000 souls. Number two, you cannot place membership in the church of Christ coming from a denomination. You got to start over. Because the Church of Christ is not a denomination. We have no affiliation with any other religious organization. We are neither Catholic, Protestant, nor Jew. We just believe and obey this Bible. That's the only rule book we have. If it's not there, it's not worth talking about. If it's there, we have to talk about it. We don't have a choice. Come to Christ today as together we stand. We encourage you to come and give when your life to him. we walked with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sign or a tear can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey.